If you think Jesus Christ, A, was white, B, would have voted for Donald Trump, C, was American, or D, any of the above, you are beyond help, and the rest of this video will only enrage you. However, if you are at all interested in how white Christian nationalism has taken over the Republican Party and how incredibly wealthy Christian business people do terrible things in his name, then this video is for you. From the beginning, Americans have been trying to stuff Jesus into politics despite the Founding Fathers having created a system that specifically prevents it. Zealots have been here since the first European ships arrived on our shores, and that has led many to mistakenly believe that the United States is a Christian nation. There's a difference between a nation filled with Christians and a Christian nation. I call it the political philosophy of Jesus, uh, something that had kind of been put together by Doug, at least this is my interpretation. Doug Coe, by the way, of the National Prayer Breakfast Movement and yeah. other things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's all scripturally based. Uh, Acts 9.15, you know, what did uh, Paul, uh, Jesus say to Paul in the road of Damascus? He said, take my name, Jesus, to the kings. And of course, if you're a member of the United States Senate in Africa, they think you're important, so you can always get in to see the kings. That's giant a-hole and corrupt former Senator Jim Imhoff talking about the infamous Doug Coe. Very few people outside of Christian fundamentalist and insider beltway circles really knew who Doug Coe was, but he was one of the most influential people of the 20th century and the early 2000s. If you're outside of these circles and have heard of Coe, you were probably introduced to him through the Netflix documentary, The Family. Coe died in 2017, but his legacy lives on. What Coe and his followers represent is the quiet, dangerous underbelly of fundamentalism that attacks liberalism and progress under the cloak of a rather radical biblical interpretation. It's a far cry from the public babbling evangelical lunacy that we're exposed to in today's media landscape. Associated Press said that Joe Biden is president. Ha! <laughs> Angels are being dispatched right now. Hamanda Aka. In terms of modern Christian nationalism and these babbling weirdos, same church, different pew. And if you're one of the bewildered members of the masses looking in from the outside wondering how the hell these people latched on to a man like Trump, who names everything after himself, shits on a literal gold toilet, cheated on his third wife with an adult film star, made ripping down his predecessor's accomplishments a priority, ate fast food in the Oval Office, has suggested putting innocent people to death, and worked less than any other president, you're not alone. And in case you missed it, those are the seven deadly sins in order. The story behind the rise of the Christian fundamentalist in American politics sound like the stuff of great fiction. But as the saying goes, it's stranger than that. A secret cabal of racist, homophobic, misogynistic white men who teach capitalism through Christ and absolve the powerful of all their sins is pulling the strings of billionaires and politicians in America. And they've been doing it for decades. These spiritual leaders are politically agnostic as they honor power over party. They've cozied up to dictators, espouse the virtues of a free market that rewards the rich and powerful. The elite are considered the chosen ones, chosen by Christ. Conscience is the work of the devil, for the rich in this life have already received one's reward. They've reconstructed Jesus to fit their station in life and turned him into whatever they need him to be. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of America. In everything they did, the Founding Fathers, many of them downright heathens if ever there were any, took great pains to eradicate the role of God in governance. After all, these were men who knew and understood that America was settled by people fleeing religious persecution. One need look no further than the Constitution itself to discover that our form of government was intended to be an entirely secular affair. Moreover, the Federalist Papers, which offer the greatest insight into the intentions set forth by the most scholarly of the Founding Fathers, explicitly denounced religious influence over government. In his portion of the introduction, James Madison credits the, quote, zeal for different opinions concerning religion, among other things, with having, quote, divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good, end quote. The majority of the writings proffered by our forefathers echo this sentiment. While freedom of religion among citizens was indeed a critical aspect of their collective philosophy, so too was freedom from religion. That doesn't mean they weren't men of faith. Some were God-fearing men who also happened to be prescient enough to exclude religion from our politics. Now, 
For those who insist on God as part of the original intent in America, allow me to disabuse you of some of the most commonly mistaken beliefs. There are no references to God in the Constitution. Period. Furthermore, the phrase, under God, was not part of the original Pledge of Allegiance, which was written by a socialist, by the by. It was formally adopted by Congress in 1954 as a reaction to the rise of communism. And finally, in God we trust is neither from the Constitution nor the Declaration of Independence. It's on our money. How very Christian of us. American history is fascinating, and the work of our founding fathers is legendary and enduring, but it's important to get it right. So, too, is it important to understand the origins of the modern Christian fundamentalist movement. Tell me a story, tell me a story. Long ago, a handful of wandering mystics roamed the country in the 1800s and early 1900s selling a new shiny brand of Jesus with little attention paid to them. Then, in the 1920s, Bruce Barton, best known as one of the B's in the BBD&O agency, published The Man Nobody Knows. It was a self-help book about corporate Jesus that spread like wildfire, and the fundamentalist movement latched onto it immediately with the thought that if you're successful in this life, then Jesus must love you. Of course, the flip side of that coin is that if you're poor through no fault of your own, it must be because Jesus hates you. Fundamentalists don't like that side of the story much, though. Barton's Jesus was the ultimate winner, the consummate salesman. The book was a pocket guide to winning with Christ that helped extricate Christianity from purely religious constraints and bring it to a wider audience as only a professional ad man could. That's right, the babbling nomadic Christian fundamentalists who evangelized throughout the United States were universally recognized as the bonkers people they were until they got a makeover by the Don Draper of the 1920s. Prior to the Great Depression, the evangelical set were more like blathering mystics than an influential political force. The mainstream transformation came when successful white Christian men who accumulated and maintained great wealth during this time were looking for absolution of the guilt they felt while their fellow countrymen fell upon hard times. Enter Abraham Veraday, the man perhaps most responsible for the modern fundamentalist Christian movement in America. Verde was able to coalesce the successful strategies and teachings of other soul surgeons of this era. By rationalizing the financial success of his followers as the earthly manifestation of Christ's will, he was able to mold a new Christian doctrine that recognized wealth, power, and influence as deliberate and divine endowments. During the Great Depression, Verde's organization began to take shape in Seattle with the creation of the New Order of Cincinnatus. The parallels between the New Order and the Republican Party today are undeniable. Like the Republican Party, the New Order cherished free market ideals and conservative morality and organized against taxes and big government. Verity's followers railed against public works projects and anything related to Roosevelt's New Deal. They wanted smaller government, less oversight, and fewer taxes. Even the great ad man Barton went on to secure a seat in Congress under the slogan, Repeal a Law a Day. Verde's organization was ultimately passed on to our protagonist of this episode, the enigmatic Doug Coe. Coe transformed it into one of the most influential and highly secretive organizations in the modern era. Nothing written, no videos, no meeting notes, only in-person meetings and pledges. The only public recognition of the group known today simply as The Family is the National Prayer Breakfast held every year in Washington, where political and business leaders assemble to pay tribute to Coe's cabal. Most of what transpired beyond the breakfast remained a complete mystery until Jeff Charlotte, a reporter and expert on religion, stumbled upon Coe's secret world, which he unraveled in his 2008 book titled The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, and his 2010 follow-up, C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. It was Charlotte's work that was adapted for Netflix and helped bring the awareness of the family to millions of homes. In terms of influence, most modern American leaders have been massively influenced by the conservative wing of Christianity for more than a century. We've invaded countries and murdered in the name of Jesus Christ. The Clintons and the Obamas attended the National Prayer Breakfast while giving the authorization to destroy nations abroad to secure their natural resources. When we invaded Iraq, President George W. Bush called it a crusade. The American public didn't blink, but the rest of the world heard those words and understood what he meant. We had state-sponsored missions to African nations to prop up dictatorships so long as they spread the word of Christ and murdered homosexuals. 
Trump's litmus test for Supreme Court nominees was their presumed views on abortion. And this brings us to the idea that we should cut taxes for the rich and end welfare programs for the poor. How could that possibly jive with the interpretation of the word of Jesus? The entire premise of this doctrine is that this life, not the next one, this one is salvation. That if you're a good person, Jesus wouldn't let you suffer in this life. So if you're wealthy, it's not a test for the afterlife. It means you've already been chosen. In this small absolution, you have the entire rationale behind the prosperity doctrine. What Doug Coe would teach our leaders is that they didn't achieve wealth and comfort in this life as a test. They achieved it as a reward. In fact, it's their responsibility to continue acquiring power, wealth, and influence in order to maintain the spiritual order and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. This tiny but incredibly important aspect of the doctrine played directly into the egos of the powerful to not just forgive them for the sin of riches, but to applaud them it's how they can argue with complete honesty that inequality is righteous and the wealthy deserve tax cuts. And if you're poor, they can pity you, but not really help you because, well, it was God's plan. Once you understand this, it all makes sense and frees you from wondering how the fuck these people can believe so wholeheartedly in such wildly inconsistent messages. It's not Christianity. Hell, it's not even a religion. It's a cult. A cult created by babbling preachers, packaged by an ad man, and sold to you from a political apothecary like the snake oil that it is. Here endeth the lesson.